Welcome to the joy of coding. Hello, and welcome to episode 276 of the joy of coding. My name is Mike Conley. I'm so happy to see you here. Um, I mean, virtually, I obviously cannot see you. Uh, but I, I think you're here. If you're watching this, you're here. If a tree falls in a forest and there's an audience, I guess they're there. By definition. Let's get started. Uh, let me share my screen. Today is January 26th, 2022. Episode 276. And a reminder... No plan survives breakfast. I don't exactly know how the stream's going to go down today. I don't know if things are going to go wrong. Maybe we'll get stuck. Maybe we'll get confused. Uh, I may have forgotten a bunch of things. Who knows what's going to happen? Um, but we're just going to try and capture how, uh, you know, I, I go about my day working on stuff and, and what that's like. Uh, warts and all. So I haven't done any, um, you know, pre-work uh, for the most part on some of these things. I say that except that the very first thing we're going to look at is actually me reviving an old patch and seeing if it still works uh, or if it if it works better than it used to. We'll get to there. We'll get to there. But at any rate, no plan survives breakfast. And sometimes, uh, sometimes I say things and then it turns out that they're not true. Um, I, it happens. So that's the first thing. <laughs> the second thing is that the uh, agenda that we're looking at uh, is available to you. If you're watching this on uh, YouTube, check out the video description. If you're watching this on Air Mozilla, check out the uh, the details section. And if you're watching this on Twitch, I'm going to drop the link into the Twitch chat. There you go. There's your agenda. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, it should get cloned over to the Twitch chat. And if people are having a hard time, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've got the, uh, the uh, bot that does the Twitch stream the twitch chat cloning working but if it's not working uh let me just quickly drop into the twitch chat and make sure people are able to see me um and hear me and, and see the chat if you're not seeing the agenda go in let me know and and i'll i'll just use the twitch chat not sure if i saw something in the twitch chat says smurf d huh see already already problems here all right try this okay here here's take two Oh, YouTube's unlisted. I forgot to accident. Ah, oh, man, so many things going wrong. I forgot to make the YouTube video listed. Um, so thanks for the uh, thanks for the heads up, folks. I'm just gonna quickly correct some things. This is how you know that this is a live stream, and you know, even after all these years, sometimes I forget all the moves. I really should have a checklist. I don't, but I really should have a checklist for all this stuff. So I'm gonna put the visibility to public. Um, done save okay visibility should now be public thank you for the heads up there folks in the twitch chat should automate yeah I should write a script to do all this stuff haven't done it maybe we'll do it someday anyways uh the uh let's see where was i yeah there there is a an agenda that we're looking at i've dropped the link into all the various places that i mentioned and if you go to like the embedded site, I mean that's that like the the joy of coding website. You can make sure you're seeing the stream, and also there's a link to the agenda right here. Uh, so that's that's the news there. Uh, before we go into things, I wanted to quickly plug a talk I'm gonna do in not this upcoming weekend, but the following weekend. It's a pre-recorded talk for Fosdem. If you're not familiar with Fosdem, uh, it is a it's a normally an in-person meetup of uh, you know people interested in open source software development in Europe, and it's obviously happening virtually right now. And that also means that it's really easy to get access to if you're not in Europe, if you're not in the area, and it's free. So if you want to see some talks, if you want to hear from Mozilla, myself, uh, other people from Mozilla about various projects, and people from the wider open source development community, you should check out the talks that are happening at FOSDEM. It happens over... February 5th and 6th, I think. Um, let's just quickly check out the web page, actually. Before I start giving you incorrect information, uh, let's quickly check out the web page. Uh, 5th and 6th of February, here's the Mozilla room. Lots of good stuff in here, uh, including talks about Firefox, Search Fox, Common Voice, Thunderbird, 
support lots of great things in here and then you know other other tracks these are like the main developer rooms and there's like some names you'll probably recognize in here like LibreOffice, matrix uh, mysql postgres python i'm trying to think if there's any other uh that kind of jump out at me here i mean bsd maybe um yeah but like there's lots of uh, valgrind if you've ever been hunting down um oh llvm if you've ever compiled things on a modern compiler javascript if you've been writing javascript anytime um graphics that's interesting what's in graphics oh things with vulcan lots of fun interesting things so check these things out you should you should check out fosdem uh now let me pop out the chat because I don't want to have to keep myself open in the ba -ba 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 -ba. there we go there's the twitch chat and then I can close twitch and I guess after this I'm gonna to have to figure out again why the twitch stream cloning isn't working in fact let me quickly kick the thing because maybe that'll make it work maybe I just have to restart it uh, there's this thing I use called Matter Bridge, and maybe I just have to restart it. But while I'm waiting for that, the interface for me to manage that to load up, I can briefly talk to you about what we're hoping to do today, or what I'm hoping to do today. There's a number of things I'm hoping to look at. The first is there's this Talos test uh, that, if you're unfamiliar with Talos, Talos is our internal performance test suite, and it's uh, you know, it tests a number of things not related to web performance, but to browser UI performance. So things like, um, you know, how fast can tabs open? How fast can tabs switch? How fast can windows open? Things like that. That is, that is how that works. And uh, there are a number, a large number of Talos tests. And, and Talos used to measure other things like page load um, stuff. And it's, it's long in the tooth. It's, it predates me. It predates me being at Mozilla, um, but a lot of our performance stuff has moved on whenever it comes to like page load tests. They're using like much more modern testing systems, much more minimal, less crufty, but our tallow stuff is what's left over from the era where we would write tests for the browser UI. And that's what we still use to, to write performance tests for the UI. And we might move to something else, hopefully soon. Like there are actually some tests being written in something else called I think we just call them perf tests. Um, uh, Mozilla perf test. I think there's just like these perf test things, which we could eventually port some of these tests to. Um, but we have not done that yet. Maybe someday, again. Uh, it's all about prioritization. But like, here's an example of, uh, of writing perf tests. This is interesting. They've got some written for like the networking team, but as well, there's some for the front end team right here. Let's quickly check this out. Um, see what one looks like. This is what one of the new ones looks like. I'm getting kind of dis distracted, but I'm fascinated at the same time. So I want to know, what does it look like? So I've restarted the matter bridge thing. Uh, I'm just gonna wait and see if any chat shows up. Uh, can anybody see this from Matrix? And if it doesn't work, well, then I've got some work to do to make things work. Oh, yeah, there it showed up. I saw my my thing show up, so that's good. Okay, so this is what a test looks like, like a modern test. And it looks like we're using some Selenium stuff to drive the browser, which, I mean, part of the challenge of writing front-end performance tests is the measurement effect, where... You know, the, the instrument you're using to instrument the browser, to test the browser, is actually influencing the score you're going to get on performance. And that's, I don't think that Talos is perfect, but one of the things it strives to do is get out of the way. So it, like, launches the browser and tries to, like, get out of the way so it can do its thing. Uh, and and tries to be a light, a relatively light touch. Um, you know, for all its faults, it's reasonably good at that. Whereas I, I worry sometimes that things like Selenium, any kind of overhead from Selenium might impact the measurement. This particular case, it's less, like this test is just testing the number of elements in the DOM. It's trying to make sure that we don't like 
it flood the dom and the shadow dom with too many things um like by default that we can create some parts of our dom lazily that's what this test was added for uh link to documents in the agenda is there a document in the agenda what smurf d i'm not sure what you mean link to documents in agenda is there let me know what you mean by link to documents in agenda uh all right so yeah talos test great uh i want to briefly uh talk about this startup about home paint cache talos test because this test was actually disabled if you look at the uh the test itself it like this is the definition of the test it doesn't say that it does a whole lot but i mean it's the definitions written in python and basically what it says is i want to run 20 times i want to load this add-on and then i want to uh i want to set these prefs and this add-on does a very simple thing it just sets up listeners to sh to figure out when the about home has finished painting on startup it's very very minimal let me let's just take a quick peek at it actually uh what was the path uh startup about home paint add-on startup test let's take a quick peek at how that works very minimal yeah there's like less than 100 lines on this thing it sets itself up it waits for the browser idle startup task uh tasks to be finished and then it pulls waiting for a probe to be set and we know that that probe is set whenever about home is finished painting and then we just report the value of that probe it's not it's not the most beautiful thing in the world but it gets the job done and anyways i mean i should say it used to get the job done the test was disabled the test was disabled back in let's look at the history here Oh, someone said, can you please add a link to the documentation on perf testing to the agenda? Yeah, sure. Uh, Moz perf test. Here, this is this is the performance testing. Uh, here, all I'll do, uh, performance testing documentation. And then there's a section specifically on Talos. And I also briefly digressed and talked about perf test. Uh, Moz perf test actually is what it's called. Moz perf test. And I believe Moz perf test, if you ever decide, if you're uh, wor working on the browser UI and you ever decide, I want to add another performance test, uh, we shouldn't write a Talos test. We should probably use Moz perf test. Um, and hopefully we can find ways hopefully there are ways that have been created to avoid any kind of overhead from from selenium like i trust the people who developed moz perf test uh they know what they're doing so chances are uh you know it, it's gonna it's gonna do the right thing i don't want to get too distracted fin wrapper mock environment goal allow new performance test rounds to be based on specific specific combination of layers Oh, I see. So a perf test, Moz perf test is like, it can run different kinds of tests. It's like a test runner, a thin wrapper. Okay. And then there are the different things that you can run tests for. All right. Well, I don't want to go too deep in there. But uh, I did want to talk about how this test was disabled. This test that we're talking about was disabled in bug 1220362. Let's pull that bug up. Back in the day. Uh two years ago this test was disabled and um that by disabling it i mean there's this list of tests and it was moved from this list into this like comment property and what i want to do is i want to re-add it because this test is uh something that i have a high degree of interest in because it exercises the performance of uh something called the startup uh, the about home uh startup cache which if you're not familiar with it, I've talked about it before. In fact, I'm pretty sure I, I did a good chunk of working on it during this stream. And if you're not sure what it is, I'll, I'll drop some reading in uh, here about home startup cache. I've looked for it before. Here, 
Uh, here, you, you do some light reading. This is what this thing is. Um, the about home startup cache. This is a thing that hasn't actually shipped. It's on on nightly. You can pref it on uh, in beta, I believe, by going to about preferences experimental. In the experimental section, there's a, a section here for the about home startup cache, but it's not shipped yet. And part of the reason is because um, you know we want to have a, a bunch of our testing infrastructure in place before we change the behavior of about home. And uh, and that makes sense, you know, about home is important. So the reason that the test was disabled was because it would periodically just sit there and hang. And I wrote a patch months ago, months ago to deal with this. Uh, and it didn't land and I wasn't sure why. Like I, I, I don't think I ever got it pushed out. Uh, I think I got distracted by something. Uh, this was something I was just kind of doing on the side. But I did some analysis. This was a year ago. This is a year ago. May have even happened during a stream. November November second was that was I streaming that day? November second of twenty twenty. Let's see. No, I was not. Oh wait, that's twenty nineteen. April twentieth of March. Where how how are our dates? October November fourth. No, okay. I was not streaming that day, but I did an analysis, and the analysis said. Uh, the test was failing because during the get info.html page load step, because one of the very first things that a Talos test does is when it, it takes a measurement of the system it's running on to get metrics on things like the display size and, um, you know, the operating system and the number of cores and the amount of available memory and how many at the clock speed of the CPU and all these various things. It, it does this in the test so it can report it out. And I think it also uses it to ad maybe adjust some of the tests. I'm not sure about that. But that is a step that runs before we actually start doing any of the measurements. But during the get info page load step that runs during the profile setup part of Talos, when the browser shuts down, we use async shutdown to write a cache of the current about home state to the disk. Uh, however, because the get info step happens so quickly, sometimes at this point the cache write doesn't include any data for top sites because the top sites feed hasn't finished initializing yet. During the test, then, the About Home document loads, but because the top sites section hasn't initialized, no top sites appear, which means that the top sites first painted timestamp time never gets set, meaning that the tele telemetry scaler that the About Home paint cache test waits for also doesn't get set. Okay, sorry, just kind of like swapping a bunch of this information back into my head. I wrote that a year ago, um, and then... I had this patch. I don't think I even posted the patch. Let's let's post the patch and take a look. Um, let's read through the patch and see what I did. Uh, submit tip single, and I'm going to say whip as well here. Let me pump up the font so you can see what I'm writing. I'm saying mozfab submit tip because I've got the patch that I, I found the patch for it. I rebased it, put it on top of central. And I'm going to say mozfab submit tip. I just want the one. I don't think I actually have to supply single. Uh, that's only if you ever have like a stack of un, un like non-landed patches, but I, I just it's a habit now. And I say dash dash whip because I don't want anyone to review it just yet. I just want to look at it. Okay, talking to fabricator. There we go. There's our patch. And uh, let's take a look and see what it does. And I will say that I tried to save a little bit of time. I didn't. I haven't checked the results, but I did rebase this patch, and then I just pushed it to try to see how it does. Um, so the first thing this patch does is it actually changes how we do logging. I have a feeling this is mainly for debugging, and we should not keep this part. Um, it changes. So what it's modifying is this component the about home startup cache component and it's getting it to log to the like standard out via something called dump and i suspect that's because i wanted to make sure that like am i was i doing any other dumping anywhere yeah i was uh i was like maybe i wanted to 
No, I have no idea. Oh, it might be because Talos does not by default output the console to standard out. When we run with like the Moki test framework for just normal browser tests, I, the console does get emitted to standard out, but on Talos tests it doesn't. So what I had done here, I guess, is I modified the log to use dump instead, and that way I could kind of trace through in the failure case and see where we got stuck. Here I hack uh, the Talos manifest to say, hey, run the test. In fact, only run the test because I don't want to have to run all of the other ones to get my results. I just want to run the one. And that's fine because we don't use the same the same um, instance of the browser. Like we, we tear down the whole thing at, between tests, create a new, uh, launch a new process, the whole kit and caboodle. So it's not like one failing would cause ours to fail or something. Um, well, that's not true. If one exploded brutally, we might not get a chance to run any of the others. Um, but what I'm trying to say is like, uh, I'm, I tried to simplify things by just saying, okay, just run this one test in isolation because it's all I care about. And then what I did here is I modified, we have this get info thing that I was telling you before. It loads this page that collects a bunch of information and it just really sloppy about it, just like dumps it to the standard out. And then uh, I... I guess I just added this documentation to say that, hey, we want to wait for startup to be finished in Go Quit application. And this is, I think, where, yeah, this is, I think, where the magic is happening. Well, let me skip past this for a second. I want to go to the other end of this. Go Quit application, yeah, it used to be called wait for safe browsing because I think there are other Talos tests that, like, need to wait for safe browsing to finish being started up. And yeah, I think I just, I wanted, gen I wanted to generalize it. And so I renamed it and, oh, I decided to do logging here. That probably doesn't need to be involved. And then this is where the bulk of the work happens. Uh, if the message data that we provided, it used to be wait for safe browsing. I renamed it to wait for start finished. I added some commentary. That's nice. We can wait for various startup items here to complete during the get info step for Talos so that subsequent runs don't have to do things like re-request the safe browsing list. We wait for the about new tabs discovery stream feed to finish being enabled here. This is because it's possible get info.html to run. It's possible for, or I should update the documentation that I added. It's possible for. for get info to run so quickly that the feed will still be initializing and that would cause us to write a mostly empty cache to the about home startup cache and shutdown which causes that test to break periodically okay uh so what i'm doing here is i do some hackery uh i get the feeds i wait for the feed to be enabled I tell the about home startup cache to cache and then we exit. Okay, uh, that, that is the majority of the patch. Now, I haven't looked yet. I'm very curious to see how the patch did. So I pushed to try. I pushed it for all of our desktop platforms, Mac OS, Linux, and Windows. I asked it to do five retriggers. Let's see how we did. Oh, I see green. I see green green um let's double check what i'm i only did five retriggers i really should have done 10 just to be sure these don't take that long it only takes two minutes so i'm gonna do five more retriggers for each of these well oh, i did six on that one that's okay more coverage and then uh it looks like we're still waiting for the mac os build to finish so we might be done here in which case the what we need to do is just clean up this patch and get it submitted so what I am going to do, though, is I'm going to comment in the bug because I was reminded of this because Sparky need infoed me today about it. And uh, yeah, it turns... Uh, thanks, Sparky. It turns out I've had a patch, a uh, whip patch for this lying around that I never posted because I'm, I must have gotten distracted by other things. 
classic me. Um, I'm going to link to the try push as well. Here's a try push. Uh, and then I want to just clean this patch up, but I, I want to wait until we get more results. Uh, I want to wait until I'm reasonably certain this thing is not going to fail intermittently again. So we might have to wait a little while during the stream. I don't expect this Mac OS build to take too much longer. It's only taken like shippable builds here. How long did this one take? Four minutes. This one should probably be done in a couple minutes and then we can do the reruns. We'll do a bunch of runs on Mac OS. And if they all come back green, I'm happy. And then we can post our, um, our cleaned up patch for review. Although... No, is there an all though? I want to make sure that there aren't any other places where, um, because we modified that one function and we're changing its behavior. Um, what was it? Get go quit application. I want to make sure that it's not being used anywhere else that might be influenced. Yeah, it's really only being used in the get info step. That's the only time we pass true. So we should behave the same um for everyone else so presumably we'd be all right we'd be all right so let's wait for this stuff to come in and then and then we'll get to make a call hopefully this isn't what happened last time in fact like when did i uh when did i post this again it was november 2nd <laughs> was november did i did i do this exact same thing in november of 2020 um When was this posted? It was November 2nd. So did I talk about it? I did talk about the About Home Startup Cache. What, what did I link to? Oh, I linked to my blog post about it from a few weeks back. Um, oh, I was trying to fix issues... <clears throat> that were caused by or part of the whole startup cash business oh okay interesting so i i wasn't working on the talos uh test itself but i was working in and around the area okay good to know good to know uh so yeah let's wait for that stuff and let's move on to this next thing while we wait for those results um do i have any change yeah let me just amend and then we'll take a look at this next thing. I got neat info on something else. Uh, I think it was yesterday. It has to do with the Mac OS, uh, Mac OS dock menu. So we show we whenever you have uh, Firefox in the dock, if you right click on it, you get some of these options here. And we provide some of these options, and two of them don't have the right casing. These are supposed to be in title case, and they are not. These are in sentence case and that's that's not what we want to do so uh yeah this looks like an oversight whoops uh because we did some title casing and uh back in the uh beginning of 2021 where we changed a bunch of our uh built-in menus to use title casing but we keep the sentence casing or sorry we use sentence casing in our built-in menus but we use title casing in anything that looks like a native menu so this is a, a native like menu it is a native menu and it's using title casing. Uh, this is a native menu and we're using title casing. This is a non-native menu. This is uh, Firefox's built-in app menu and it's using sentence casing. And the reason for that is because we want to look native in the in the sort of the places where we integrate nicely in the uh, in the OS, but we also want to use sentence casing everywhere else. Um, yeah, so that that's the idea. And it looks like we we missed a step here. We we skipped. We accidentally are grabbing the wrong strings for these. So I don't actually know where these strings come from, but we're going to figure that out. Um, so let's let's weigh in here because that's I got neat info on this 19 hours ago. Let's figure out where those strings come from. So anytime we touch the like the native code um, or like the not the native code, anytime we touch the operating system, like for something in the dock, there's usually something some kind of like XPCOM interface for front end to give it information 
or there is like a, a privileged web IDL interface. So that's what I'm going to look for for first. I'm going to look for something called like doc, uh, like Mac doc. See if there's anything like that. Yeah, here we go. Mac doc support. And there's like an XPCOM thing here. All right. So you can provide application specific doc menu items. That sounds very relevant. Ensure app is pinned to doc. Okay, so who uses Mac doc support? That was a lucky guess. I did not expect to get it first time around. Um, open browser window from doc menu, non browser Mac. There's some show sharing door hanger. There's some dev tool stuff here. Mac doc support. This is the implementation right here. Let's see where, like, what we do in some of these. Um, here we're just like reporting whether or not we are in the doc via telemetry. Um, if this is the hidden window being closed, release our reference to the doc menu element to prevent leaks on shutdown. That is not what we're doing. Ah, here we go. Set up the doc menu. Non-browser. Oh, this is in the hidden window, though. Non-browser window startup. Doc menu element get. Element menu, Mac doc menu. Let's see if this is what we think it is. There's this menu pop up and it's got Well this may this these would make sense if this is causing the problem. Uh, app menu item new window, app menu item new private window, I'm pretty sure those map to sentence cased strings. because it's it's just yeah new window new private window so i'll bet you if we change those um in fact let's let's do a quick experiment uh what is the value that's being set on those um uh, 24 it's the label the label so what we'll do just as an experiment is first of all make sure I like to just kind of cross my T's, dot my I's here. I'm going to launch uh, nightly. I'm going to right click on this. Okay, I've got new window, new private window. So I'm going to shut down now. We're going to open up this document. Uh, not this, not that. This one here, hidden window mac.xhtml. And instead of using these fluent strings, I'm just going to be like label equals test one label equals test two. Let's see if uh, these show up. And if they do, then I'm, I'm pretty confident that we can just swap those out for the uh, the, the ones that the, the strings that we use up here, new window, new private window. That's probably the fix here is to just use those kinds of strings and uh, and maybe add a comment saying that you know we should be using title case for these. Uh, whoops, what do I want to do? Yeah, test one, test two. Hey, we did it. Okay, great. And I actually think as well that we have some tests for this. Uh, we have some tests that we wrote a while back. There was something that I wrote about uh, menu bar, about casing, static. Title case menus, APA style, title case strings where appropriate. So we should probably, on Windows, Mac OS, GTK, KDE, Linux, menu bars are expected to be in title case in order to feel native. This test iterates the menu item labels of the menu main menu bar to ensure that US, ENUS, US strings are all in title case. We use APA style title case for the menu bar rather than photon style title case to match the native platform conventions. So minor words that are OK to not be capitalized when they're mid-string. OK, that's how that works. 
So we might actually want to extend this test to um, make sure that all of the items in the hidden window menu pop up here result like they, they have um, title case. So let's put the uh, strings back here, but let's start by writing our test. Um, So on Mac OS, uh, all right, this test, you know, I want to say this test iterates the menu item labels of the doc, uh, the doc menu for the um, application to ensure the ENUS strings are all in title case. Um, I should say Mac OS doc. Which makes me wonder as well, like what we show on Windows. Um, let me just open up my. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to show you all my personal email. Oh. Hang on. Let me close this. Um, let me close all these tabs. And go to home. Okay. All right. So if I have Windows here and I right click on the dock, the task tray, rather, the task bar. Now that's interesting because it looks like Windows has a convention of using sentence case. See, these are the kinds of inconsistencies we have to deal with. So, uh, and I don't know what they do on what, what's going on in Linux land. Uh, let's see. Let's see what Ubuntu does. Is that the right password? Did I get it? No. There we go. While we wait for that, any updates on our tests? Hey, all green here. I'm really feeling good about this. Feeling good. Uh, where's our... Wow, this is taking a while, this Mac OS one. Does it normally take that long? Come on. All right, uh, if you were to launch the Firefox web browser and then open up the menu, what do they call it on, on uh, sure. What do they call it on here? Open a new window, open a new private window. I don't know what they call this on Ubuntu but it looks like they use title case. Remo well, at least we do. All windows. Let's see what other applications do, like the terminal. New window, all windows. Yeah, OK. They use title case. I wonder where that comes from. Presumably, there's some kind of like Linux doc. Um, doc support. Shell service, maybe. GNOME shell service. The gnome shell service do Let's see that. Um, might be under widget GTK. IDL. No. Gnome doc, gnome doc. Yeah, what what supplies those strings to the gnome system tray? I guess let's find out uh, in private window. Let's take a look and see where these. Uh, strings are used. We can sort of hunt this down. Open a new private window, rather. Open a new private window. Uh, oh. Oh, it's here, maybe, in how the thing is packaged. Oh, okay. 
Okay, so not a whole lot of control here. We, uh, it's like how the application is packaged. We like bundle the string ourselves manually, it looks like. So we're, we're I don't even think we have access to the ability to test that, um, but for Mac OS we do, and so we can write the test for us. Um, do, 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 go, do, go, go. So this test uh, iterates the menu items labels for the Mac OS dock menu. Uh, so we only ever, uh, APA test title case, Mac OS dock menu. So if we are not on Mac OS, because this test will run, uh, what do we use? Uh, app constants platform it's not equal yeah they're like you'll see it in some of our tests if it's not equal to windows then we'll do a thing if not equal to mac os return like that's exactly what we want to do here we just take that snippet if we're not on mac os get out of here otherwise let's see if we can get access to the uh, doc menu uh, via yeah um, what's the API again standalone native menu native init doc menu get create instance of it we init it and then we set it to the native menu standalone native menu where is the Oh boy, force update init. How do we get stuff out of it? Menu, we init it. Doc menu element. It might be simpler to just get at the hidden window and just interrogate this thing exact uh, it, like directly. Um, doc menu get element by ID. We don't hide these. So we have to get access to the hidden window. Hidden window. And I think we can do that with the app shell service. Yeah, NSI app shell. Something, yeah. Uh, hidden, no, no, okay. Hidden window, something in an IDL somewhere, create, destroy. Here we go. Application provide hidden window has hidden window. Oh, is yeah, it is the app shell service. Sorry, not the app shell. So we're gonna get the app shell service, which I think we can get at if we just type in like services dot shell. No, how do we get the uh, app shell service? What's the best way of doing it? Um, so one thing I learned recently is if you look at how a thing is registered, oh, it's called app shell. If you look at the JS name in the components.conf file, it will tell you how a thing is exposed on services. So it's actually services.app shell. Okay. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. So uh, we'll get at the hidden window services dot app shell dot hidden window will assert that we have it could get at hidden window and then we're going to get at the document hidden window dot document let's uh, menu equals hidden window dot document dot get element by ID and what was it called forgetting uh, Mac menu Mac doc menu and then that is of type what is the Mac, menu Mac doc menu it's of type menu pop-up so we can just pass in check menu items so I'll call this a menu pop-up so I'll say check menu items 
menu pop up. And I'm guessing if, if we've done our job right, this should fail. So let's run this test. Let me just quickly see if there's any chatter. I think you can. It's just that Firefox chose to use their own to have more control. Ever X80 says, so in Mac, you can't have actions for an app that doesn't provide them in code? Interesting. And then Smurf D says, I think you can. It's just that Firefox has chosen to use their own to have more control. Oh, cool. Sometimes just adding cu custom actions in a desktop file. Yeah, I don't know about uh, Mac OS and like how you could populate this with other things. Like obviously Mac OS is providing certain things. Like we're not providing this options menu. I think we're just adding stuff in here. And I think everything else is being provided by Mac OS. So maybe you can augment it in other different ways, but we get a little slot in here for as an application to put stuff. All right, uh, wait, browser based content test static. It's a static test browser title case menus. Excuse me. Let's quickly run this test and see what happens. I haven't gotten any questions in the uh, the form recently in the uh, rate this episode form. So if anyone has any, oh yeah, there we go. Oh no, this is a different kind of hidden window dot document is undefined. Well, what's it supposed to have? If I get services dot app shell dot hidden window, what is it? Oh, I see. There is a doc shell on it. Um, let's see how other people have gotten at the document. Services dot hidden window dot. Oh, sorry. App shell dot hidden window. Seriously, no one uses that thing. That can't be right. Is it hidden DOM window? No. Services hidden DOM window. Let's see what happens. Document. Yeah, this might be it actually. Uh, get element by ID. Um, let's see, menu Mac doc menu. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So instead of hidden window, we'll say hidden DOM window. All right, let's run this test now and see what happens. Nope. Good, so we did fail. Now we failed on purpose because we New window for Mac doc menu, new window should have title casing. New private window for Mac doc menu, new private window should have title casing. Correct. So we are correctly failing. So now this is me exercising test driven development and that, you know, it's good or bad or whatever, what have you. But sometimes it's satisfying to like set up the bar and then jump over the bar. So now we have set up the bar. Let us now jump over the bar. So instead of using app menu, new window or app menu, new private window, we should use a different set of strings. This, the ones that we use up here, which I believe are in menu bar.ftl. So instead of app menu.ftl, we should use menu bar.ftl. And then the strings themselves, new window, are menu file new window and menu file new private window. I believe. Um, see how it works. Menu file, new window. And then let's see how. Yep, yeah, that's how that works. All right. Uh, let's see what happens now. Let's build it. Smurf D just added a link to the Stack Overflow. 
asking how one could use to programmatically add items to the dock. So, I mean, yeah, there. it sounds like you could use something in the plist file, but the way that we do it for Mac OS uh, here is probably via, um, like we, we were looking at that file, Mac doc support. I'll bet you whenever you like supply the menu, set doc menu, um, we must do something. Refresh dock. This only requires you. Wait, what? Uh, get is in app dock. Sure, app is pinned to dock. How do we do it? Dock tile. That's not right. Set progress state. Set badge text. Something maybe calls get dock menu. like how was M doc menu used for yeah who's gonna use that who calls get doc menu here we go Mac application delegate goes and gets it and then gets the native menu and then obtains a copy of the native menu and then like so this is all inside of this uh, NS menu application doc menu sender create the manage code in the doc I guess this is a, some kind of interface we're implementing we're responding to a message to open the doc menu uh, must say the uh, yeah here we go returns the apps doc menu so we're actually just com we're just hooking in, like implementing this function. Um, and then you get to return the menu that's displayed. So that's how you can do it programmatically. Okay, anyways, uh, let's run the test now, see if it passes. I think was, I said this to some other people last week, but I hope it's all right that I'm so easily distracted. I am an easily, think of me as a very easily distracted tour bus driver. Uh, good, so the test passes. And uh, let's launch this thing. And let's check out the dock menu. It, it still says test one and test two, that's not right. Hang on, did I, I built, right? No, come on, how, how come it still says test one, test two? Did I fail to? Is there some caching maybe? There we go. New window, new private window. That's what we wanted to see. Versus new window, new private window, which are these things. Okay, so fixed it, wrote a test, feeling good. Let's quit, post this up for review. Everx says, I would worry more if the chat distracted you from doing what needs to be done. Well, in a way it did. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't need to do that deep dive into how the Mac OS dock thing worked, but it didn't take too long. All right, so we've got our patch written here. Uh, bug, what is this bug? Bug 1751560. Use um, file menu strings for uh, title cased file menu strings. Mac OS doc menu items and who can review this? Um, let's have Molly review this. Um, 
Um, so let's just quickly check our work here. Added the menu bar, changed the IDs, added a test. Textbook. Textbook. Now, uh, what's this being applied on top of? I don't want to accidentally apply this on top of. Yeah, the, the Talos thing. So let's rebase that on top of Central. And speaking of that Talos thing, we can take a look at it in a second. Um, so now where am I? Yeah, that looks right. So mozfab submit tip single. And that should cause me to be automatically assigned. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, whoops. Uh, yeah, this looks like like an oversight. Ooh, I just got a coffee delivery. Thank you very much. Delicious. Uh, this looks like an oversight um, on our part. Patch income, patch up. Of course, uh, submit only my new comment. Uh, and clear the need info request. Hooray, so we've got our patch up. Looking good, looking good. Um, all right, what, what now? Let's see how we did over here. So these are still running. Oh, it's been queued. They haven't actually run yet. So hopefully, I guess we're having a hard time getting some machine time. And for some reason, it is taking a while to build this shippable instance. How long does it normally take? Uh, if I were to open up Mozilla Central, for example, and take a look at how long it normally takes to build the 64, uh, the ARC 64 cross-compiled shippable for Mac OS, uh, build PGO. How long does it normally take? 44 minutes. Okay. And so we're at 37 minutes. So we're actually, we're almost there. I'm a little bummed we haven't seen these things turn green up here yet, but I, my confidence is growing. Um, you know, we just have to get these machines these tests queued let's go let's let's go um now what we did we're waiting on this we did this oh right so we had a, a a session last week where we were working on this issue related to the copy item or like the, the copy menu item in the context menu the content context menu after you do a tab tear out and we did a little bit of a dive into like how tab tear out works. And I came up with maybe a solution. And there's been some conversation in here. And I can't say I've really sort of come back to this. But now let's come back to it. So this is a continuation of stuff we did last week. Um, so Emilio wrote, So the way adjust focus after tab switch checks for focus moves is here. Come on, search Fox. Right. Basically, we blur and check if the active element is still the document body. Instead, we could keep a reference to the old active element and check that the old active element isn't the active element, right? The main issue, which is, I suppose, but haven't checked uh, on blame why that code is written the way it was, is if the focus move happened inside the content process, even though the focus had moved inside the tab. So I think the current code is dealing with that right now by expecting that if the focus moves inside the tab, we refocus the browser. However, it seems to me that there would be a more straightforward way to check for focus moves, and that way of detecting focus moves seems inherently racy in an E10S world. If the current code wasn't written that way because of that case, then we should just simplify that code, and that should fix the bug, right? Okay, and then Heist responded five days ago and says, I'm sorry I haven't gone back to this. I have not had time to do a deep dive, and I'm a little confused about the relationship between the active content browsing context and the blurring that the tab search code is doing. When I haven't done a deep dive, it looks a little bit like the suggestions in comment 26 and comment 28 
would change the code that happens to trigger this race condition in this case such that it no longer occurs because we wouldn't call blur but any other code that would call blur or focus at the wrong moment could still cause the race condition to be hit in fact i wonder if this could even be done by websites themselves if i'm not wrong then although comment 28 sounds compelling in terms of simplifying the tracking of focused elements in the async tab switcher also because if i recall correctly the blurred focus calls can trigger sync layout flushes and although it might fix the issue here as described it wouldn't address the root cause and other steps slash coincidences could still cause the same race condition to happen and that would make me think to look for the solution elsewhere i.e somehow fix the active content slash parent browsing context machinery so that this race condition cannot occur or so we revalidate slash resync things at critical points so that we don't end up out of sync but perhaps i'm wrong neil mike what do you think that was the last comment and so basically translation uh i put up a solution uh, like I, I proposed a solution uh here and then emilio proposed a different kind of solution and heiss's claim is that both of these are actually just kind of wallpapering over the issue and that the real issue is that we are having the parent process and the content process kind of go out of sync. And I'm sorry we're going to have to go through this again, but I think it's important to sort of like swap back in our mental model of like what's going wrong here. So here we go. Here we go. Um, so when things go right, the tab being dragged out has window lowered called on it. That's weird that window lowered is called on a tab. Window lowered is invoked on the tab being dragged out. I, so it must be, they must be talking about the the window itself. And then send unset browsing, active browsing context is called to inform the parent process. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. In the tab content being dragged out, not the, the tab element, but the tab content. Okay, that makes sense. And then the content process sends this message, unset active browsing context uh, to inform the parent process that the browsing context is no longer active. And then window lowered is invoked on the old parent process window. So it goes away. And then window raised is invoked on the newly created parent process window. And then window raised is invoked on the new, like the, the content area that got swapped in. And then send set active browsing context is called to inform the parent process that this browsing context is now active. Okay, that is the su success scenario when it fails and i apologize <laughs> i feel like uh, if you were watching the stream last week i've i've t <laughs> we kind of went really deep here and i'm repeating myself but i have to do this because this is stuff is so heady and complicated that i have to kind of get it back into my head so i apologize um also i hope my mic's not too hot uh in fact let me let me adjust the gain there okay so the window raised is invoked on the other background tab, the one not being dragged. So we do the tab switch first. We focus the other tab. To inform the parent process, right okay so a message is sent i have to we have to be real, really clear here about what process we're in so a message is sent to the content process to say hey i'm switching i'm activating the background tab the one not being torn out and then in response to that the um content process for that background tab sends a message to the parent process saying hey uh 
hey, I'm now active. So I'm going to inform you that I am now active. I send a message, send said active browsing context. And then the parent process is like, okay. And then the M active browsing context is set to that background tab. Uh, EverX80 says, I love this explanation slash walkthrough of the bug. Hey, good. I'm glad. Um, Smurfy says, I think the audience might have scratched the brains as well. It's quite complicated. Yes, it is. It is. I mean, I will not lie. This one is a bit of a headache. I mean, if last episode, because we went, I'm only going to be streaming for another like 23 minutes or so. If you're really interested in this stuff, last week's episode goes much, much deeper into like tab tearing in particular and like the individual steps here. Um, so if you want more context, I highly recommend watching that. But even having done that, and even with all of my years of experience working in the tab switching and the tab tear out code and periodically bumping into focus stuff, all this stuff is very complicated and I have a hard time keeping it in my head. So I'm glad that Neil wrote this comment. Uh, Neil is uh, Neil is, is on, the, on the case here. Uh, EverX writes, so this bug happens when someone drags a tab out of the window into a new window? Yeah, in fact, uh, maybe let's just refresh our memories and I'll show you the bug. I'll show you what the bug looks like when it happens. So let's open up some tabs. So I've got two tabs here. How Wheaties became the breakfast of champions and a frozen graveyard, the sad tales of Antarctic deaths. Antarctica's death, deaths. So one of the things you might notice is if I like highlight some text and I right click on it, I get a bunch of items. But uh, pay attention to the top item here to copy to the clipboard. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to tear this tab out so I tear the tab out, it becomes a new window. I'm gonna copy the text in the new window and right click. And the copy item is un, is like disabled. It's disabled. And if I unfocus the window and refocus the window, it becomes enabled again. That is the bug. Um, and we've done a deep dive into figuring out like why the bug exists. And the reason the bug exists is because there's some confusion in the parent process about which window is focused um, they go out of sync so like this this comment kind of walks through what happens in the success case because it can happen that the test will like the copy will be enabled sometimes but in my experience it's usually disabled but effectively it's a race so let's walk through this again so window raised is invoked on the other background tab the one that you switch to um after the after the tear out has begun and it sends a message up to the parent saying hey i've become focused update your active browsing context in chrome member so it does and then window lowered is invoked in the content area of the tab being dragged out which this is after um uh we've done a frame loader swap presumably so that contains a blank page and then window lowered is invoked on the old parent process window. So, so far, this all sounds reasonable, like reasonable. These are reasonable set of steps. And then window lowered is invoked on the other background tab. Because we're switching focus away from that window. And so it sends unset active browsing context is called to inform the parent process that the browsing context for the other tab is no longer active. And so in the parent process, M active browsing context in Chrome is set to null. And then window raised is invoked on the newly created parent process window. And window raised is invoked on the new tab that was dra being dragged out. However, nothing here informs the parent process that this browsing context is now active. Essentially the failure case has us trying to adjust the active browsing context in content for the process for the tab that we aren't dragging. In particular, M active browsing context in content, not in Chrome, in content for the tab that we're dragging out is never modified during the tab tear off process. So raising it at the end of step six just returns early. Yeah, that's the bug. They go out of sync. Uh, 
everx 80 says it happens even if one does right click on a tab move tab move to new window so it's not just specific to dragging that's true it's it's just what that that operation of pulling a tab into a new window dragging or or, or otherwise yes that will go through the same um the same code paths and create you can create the same issue that way so let me draw my mental model here because I think that's going to help me kind of conceptualize open up Krita okay and then let me switch my camera or display to over here and new file explaining okay and let's switch to my explaining palette okay so here's my interpretation of what was being written in that uh let me move the microphone a little so i'm going to be slightly out of frame uh, i apologize uh, actually maybe i can just move my monitor a little so you can see me we're gonna get green screen leakage if i do that actually um so i'm just gonna be out of frame slightly i apologize okay so we have our starting condition i i know i drew this last week i drew this last week but this is gonna be slightly different um and i'm gonna call this one two i'm gonna call this one one so here's here's step one is we drag and what I'm what we're drawing is like the failure case is that we drag this tab out we create a new a new window it has one in it we do a frame loader swap And then reading this comment again, window raised is invoked on the other background tab. So we switch to two. We switch to two. Two becomes focused. And this one goes like, hey, I'm focused. I'm going to put F here for focused. And that's inside the content area. Because what's going what we need to remember is uh, we need we have like an internal uh, the content process has an internal representation of the active browsing context and the parent process has one as well and what's pro going wrong is that they're going out of sync so the parent process which has this like focus member I'm just going to I'm going to symbolize that by just like putting PF and put CF and they are still in sync with one another but window raised is invoked on the other background tab and send set active browsing context is, in call, is called to inform the parent process that the browsing context for the other tab is now active. Now here's the other thing. Before we even got there, this tab, this content thought it was active and the parent process matched. And now this content process thinks it's active and the parent process agrees. But the one that we tore out, this is now like blank. Um, the one we tore out, because it's a different content process, also thinks it's active. Because these two are running in different processes, maybe. that's. I think that's what causes this bug to sometimes occur and sometimes not, is because those two tabs might be running in different processes. And so this one thinks it's this one thinks it's focused it's like oh yeah the parent thinks i'm the active one but in reality this is the one that's actually focused and the parent agrees and so then we get to the point where uh this tab having been torn out we like close this one down and we defocus this window like this this uh, like we the the parent process says okay this new window I've opened up let's focus it so the parent process clears its um, its 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 
No, hang on. What happens? The content says, hey, I'm no longer focused. I'm clearing my conception that I'm focused. Uh, you shouldn't be focused. You shouldn't think I'm the active browsing context anymore. So then the parent process focus conception is then um, uh, null, which I will put just the ground symbol. And then uh, this one becomes focused, the window one over here. But because it's already focused, it already thinks it's focused here, it goes, well, there's nothing to do. And it doesn't tell the parent process, hey, I just became focused because it thinks it's already focused. And so like the parent process focus state stays null. And that's the bug. That is the bug. Uh, I see some commentary in the chat. Let me see if there are any questions. Uh, wow, I can reproduce, but never hit this IRL. Here, I'm going to drag the, ta the, the chat into here so we can all read it together. Wow, I can reproduce, uh, but never hit this IRL. I think I don't drag tabs out often enough. It happens even if one does the right click on a tab, move tab. So it's not just specific to dragging. The question might be silly, but what is the purpose of disabling the copy menu entry? It's not on purpose. It's just a bug. It's never should never be disabled. I mean, why is there code to even disable it? No other items get disabled. I don't know if I'm asking correctly. Uh, okay, yeah, good question. Uh, the reason for that is because sometimes things can't be copied. Uh, let me let me uh, give you an example. Let's see if I can come up with an example. Sometimes things can't be copied. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. So for example, I don't have anything anything selected right now. If I right click, copy isn't even an item. I have to select some text and then I can copy it. Uh, if I right click and choose copy, if, if copy was just around, what would that do? Should it select all and copy all the text? That's not exactly obvious. So it's a matter of like being obvious. When the user selects a thing, then we present copy and we make it enabled. Now, why would we ever want it to be visible but disabled? Um, I'm trying to remember why that might be. Um, is there ever a time where you can select text and not copy it? Is there a time where you can do a selection and not copy it? Um, let's take a look at the code that disables it. Command copy. Uh, browser context command command copy yeah who who sets the value uh, for copy command copy without getting too in the weeds I am curious Controller. Hmm. Command. Action delegate. Command. Common dialog. Go update command. Command copy. Controller is command enabled. That's, I think, what matters. Is command enabled? In the controller's parent support device. Where is it? Let's go back. Okay, so this command on text edit on text editor it's enabled. Uh, That's if you're in the editor. I, I'm in the wrong place. Text enabled. Resize URL bar. Undo. Is there an is command enabled in native code, maybe? Is command enabled. Yes. I'm just curious now when we would ever disable copy. Base command controller. I 
I have no idea where the mapping is. <laughs> I have no idea where the mapping is. This is somewhere deep. Uh, editor. Again, editor makes sense. Somewhere. Edit command enabled. It's true. Uh, so that's just like always they're all enabled. It's clipboard command enabled. That sounds interesting. Get in link, copy link location. If we're on, if it's a copy link command, copy link, copy image, get contents command is clipboard. Can get contents. So if it turns out we can't copy things, there's a, th there's a way that you can choose things that I guess you can't copy. Oh, if, if the selection is in a collapsed region, that's why. Uh, so yeah, if, if you have a selection, because you can, um, of course, let's do an example here. Um, my, uh, my test. Let's put some little text in there. So we've got some text. And then what we're going to do is we're going to, um, you have a selection, but if you can't see it, that's whenever we want to disable copying because we don't want you to accidentally put things into your clipboard. I think it's a security thing. We don't want you to accidentally put things in your clipboard without you being able to have a clear idea of what it is. Um, so let's let's just make sure this works. Set timeout. I I don't that's a guess. I don't know actually know if that's the case. Um, my test dot uh, style dot display equals none. Okay, so after five seconds, that'll disappear. So I'm going to select some text, copy is enabled, and then, oh, still enabled. Oh, but it doesn't actually copy it. But for some reason, copy was still enabled. I have no idea. I <laughs> Is collapsed, what does that mean? Styled range is length, collapsed. Is the whole, re whole selection just one point or unset? Oh, if part of it is collapsed. Because, yeah, you can have a selection over multiple containers. And if part of it's collapsed. I think that makes sense. Okay, not my area of expertise. But um, it's clear that it's exp like there is a there is a reason. Um, it's I don't know if it's a good reason, but there is a reason uh, why we do it. Hey, we've got our build here, our PGO build. Um, and presumably the test will soon be running. I don't know why. Oh, I think it has to like make the build, then run the build with instrumentation and then recompile the build, having reorganized the build with the, the recording, the PGO recording. And then that's the build that we're going to run the test with. Hilarious. EverX80 says, sorry for the distraction. It's not a problem. I'm glad you asked. But uh, it's the sort of thing where, unfortunately, I don't have a great answer. Uh, I can make a guess. And my guess is that it's to avoid making it possible for you to copy things when it's not clear what you'll be copying. Like if part of the selection is in a collapsed region is what it looks like to me. Because then you could accidentally copy. A... Suppose, for example, someone's like, hey, uh, copy the snippet of code and paste it in your uh, browser console, and it will make your browser faster. And it looks benign, but there's like a collapsed region inside of it that um, does really bad things. I don't think we want you to be able to copy that. I think that's part of the reason, at least. Something I could, I, I thought, uh, I think seems probable anyways okay so what are we gonna do <laughs> what 
what are we gonna do about this uh this issue because i agree with heiss like the um this issue where the uh the parent process is confused or rather this content process is confused it thinks it's still focused when it's not um I wonder if it should blur itself. Maybe the very first thing it should do internally is clear its focus state whenever you do a frame loader swap. Hmm. Murphy says it's not just the parent process that's confused. Yes, I'm also confused. <laughs> but like I feel like by the time by the time like this thing gets cleared up here we're already in a confused state. The fact of the matter is that um the the pro the the frame loader swap caused this tab over here to become focused and then the other one over here still thought it was focused and it's not i think it it, it it is lying to itself it is lying to itself and I, I think we have to try and avoid lying to ourselves so let's try an experiment let's see what happens let's try and solve this problem by clearing the focus state in the content area if we've just done a swap of ourselves let's just see what happens if we do that um what time is it 228 i think we've got time for this i don't want to spend i think i've got like a meeting at three so and i have to prepare for it so i, I don't know if this is going to be practical but let's just see what happens first of all i want to know um what's the best way to clear a focus state internally is it to blur it um Um, the focus manager. What I want to do is say like M active browsing context in content equals null. And now that, that last one we just saw is in the constructor. So don't care about that one. Oh no, it's an, it's an observer for when we're shutting down. Okay. That makes sense. But that's not the code path we're going to enter. Here, we're running it inside of when the window is hidden. Here, we're running it when we say set active browsing context in content. And presumably, Wait, set active browsing context from other process. So that's interesting. I would expect if we can do this, it sounds like the focus manager in the content process can hear about the other content, the other browsing context becoming focused. So why didn't it, did it hear about it? And if not, why didn't it? When the child se send send set active browsing context send active browsing context whenever the focus manager each other parent. We received a message that, hey, I'm becoming active in 
the parent process. Then we get this group, the browsing context group for the context that's associated with whatever one just said, hey, I'm just now focused. And then we say, hey, send said active browsing context. Yeah, hold on. This is this is a very good question. Why don't why doesn't the focus manager what step here? Window lowered is invoked. Window lowered is invoked on the other background tab. Send unset active browsing context is called to inform the parent process that the browsing context for the other tab is no longer active. I feel like step four part like we should send a message to the it's called it. No, here. When we get when the parent process is called here for the other background tab the one that we tore out should hear that hey uh, you did not you you're no longer active and is that oh the problem is that in step two a request to window lowered is called on the child process but it doesn't arrive until after the browser swapping is happening A request to window lowered is called, but it doesn't arrive until after the browser swapping is happening. So it, it does receive a message, but that it contains the blank about blank. I see. When we drag out a tab is a new window. I think it's swapping a blank with a new window that we call blur. Because this code thinks that the blank page is being lowered rather than the real page that it thinks is focused. active browsing context is not equal to the very top of the window. Why wouldn't we clear it? Real page is assigned as the active browsing context and returns early. The real page is assigned as the active browsing context and returns early. Makes me wonder if maybe during the frame loader swap we're supposed to be switching what the active browsing context is supposed to be as well. Hmm. Hmm. Wings in the sky nah, asks, "What are you currently working on right now?" Oh, it's brutal. Uh, we're trying to fix a bug. Well, we've got a couple of solutions to a, uh, a bug, but it's uh, it's this bug in Firefox for um, when you move a tab into a new window, uh, a menu item becomes disabled. 
And we've got a couple of different possible solutions, but I'm looking for like the right one. Um, hmm. And yeah, this uh, thread, this, it's not really threads. I guess you can think of them as threads. Concurrency is fun. <laughs> concurrency is fun. Racing and concurrency is fun. In this particular case, we're dealing with individual main threads as opposed to like sub threads of a process. I guess you could say threads are fun. Um, so let me write a comment and then I'm going to stop the stream. So I've thought about this a bit more. I agree with Heiss. Uh, my solution and Emilio's solution kind of wallpapers over the issue. The real issue seems to be to be the going out of sync part. I think part of the confusion might be that the focus manager, I suspect part of the confusion that the focus manager isn't aware, isn't prepared, isn't informed about the frame loader swap. Um, where, where is his comment? He wrote a really good one. success case the old browser has not been removed yet so we can blur it properly in the failure case we call blur on the temporarily blanked page just focus on the parent post probably that fails during window lowered because the code thinks that the blank page is being lowered rather than the real page that it thinks is focused. Real page is assigned as the active browsing context. So in fact, the active browsing context does get swapped. The focus manager's conception of it does get swapped, but the parent process still thinks that the content Oh boy. All right. Um, where do we do that frame loader swapping stuff? Um, fire page hide. For frame loader swap here. This is how I find my way. Obviously, you see swapping with other frame loader. show event update tab context after swap yeah it's almost like the parent process's conception of the active browsing context needs to be corrected the swap occurs the content process is like hey i'm over here now this is my active browsing context and the focus manager then the tab switching go code says hey I'm, I'm trying to blur this this blank tab here I'll blur here. Because the parent process thinks that the active element Is the previous window 
is the previous browser actually. All right, I'm gonna have to think about this more. We did not figure this out, but uh, I think we will. I feel like I'm getting closer, but I gotta end here because I got a meeting to go to in like 19 minutes. So, hey, thank you so much for watching episode 276 of The Joy of Coding. It was a lot of thinking, um, a bit of coffee, uh, and I don't know if we got our answer on this Talos thing. I hope, I hope we're getting, oh, we've got these test runs happening now. So hopefully these will all turn green and we can get this stuff landed. We can get this, uh, test you know let me re-trigger these uh we can get this test up to date and landed that'd be really really nice and then uh yeah let me know what you thought let me know what you thought of the stream there's a link at the end of the agenda here called uh for rating rating the episode in fact let me put the form in the chat as well rate this episode link and not only can you give me a sense of what you liked and didn't like you can also ask me questions that i will try to answer during the next stream excuse me which will be next wednesday at 1 p.m eastern time uh it should be um and yeah and then the following weekend you can come check out my fosdem talk and you can ask me questions there too so with that thanks again so much for watching episode 276 of the joy of coding i hope that was interesting i hope uh you got something out of it um and i'll see you soon take care bye bye the joy of coding See ya.